good-looking, charismatic, charming, successful, a man that any parent would love their daughter to marry. There was only one problem. Paul Bernardo was a sadistic maniac who had raped and attacked scores of young women. When he met the beautiful Carla Homolka, they seemed like the picture of young love. But what started as lust at first sight quickly become a fatal attraction. Let's profile this psychopath. Before we delve into the story of Paul Bernardo, I just wanted to take a moment to make something clear. If any of you are familiar with this story, then you will know that I cannot talk about Bernardo and his crimes without also talking about Carla Homolka. However, any deep analysis and information in this video is purely related to Bernardo. I will not go into Carla's life story as she may very well be featured in a later episode. With that clear, let's begin. Paul Kenneth Bernardo was born August 27th, 1964, in Scarborough, Toronto. He was born into a somewhat dysfunctional family. His mother, Marilyn, was domineering and wasn't known to be particularly affectionate. Paul would later comment, which would be corroborated by other family members, that his mother never once told him that she loved him. There's no evidence that she was physically abusive to Paul, but she was certainly verbally and mentally abusive. His father, Kenneth, was a rather sordid individual who was known as a sexual voyeur and peeping Tom. Kenneth was constantly sexually inappropriate to any female that he encountered, and it has been strongly reported that he had sexually abused his own daughter. Despite the turmoil within the family, young Bernardo appeared to be a fairly well-adjusted child. He was well-liked at school, and he joined the Boy Scouts, which he excelled in, later becoming a summer camp counsellor. Bernardo was successful at most sports that he attempted in high school and was always the first student picked to be in a team. His good looks also meant that he was successful with the girls at school, having the pick of any female that he wanted. With all this success, his ego was huge and the narcissism that would later define him blossomed here. However, all the promise and drive the teenage Bernardo had was decimated when his mother dropped a bombshell. When Paul was 16 years old, his mother told him that Kenneth was not his biological father and that he was conceived as the result of an extramarital affair. When his mother finally told him the truth, she got much enjoyment from calling Paul her, quote, bastard child. Knowing this, and now believing his whole life was a lie, Paul seethed with rage and begun to hate his mother, and as a result, all women. The only woman who he should have been able to rely on and feel safe with, turned his life upside down. Paul and his mother began to argue constantly, and at times the rows become physical. Kenneth, who would try and break up the mother and son, would also fight with Paul. When Paul knew that Kenneth was not his actual father, any authority Kenneth once had disappeared. Paul refused to be disciplined by a man who was not his father. Kenneth was not worthy of that job. As much as Paul hated Kenneth, they did share one unhealthy interest. From 16 years of age, Paul Bernardo had begun to spy on the females in his neighbourhood at night, looking through their bedroom windows. Paul was caught several times as a peeping Tom and was beaten by one husband when he caught him at his bedroom window. When the rumours circulated around town of Paul's nightly activities, the parents of his friends forbid them to associate with Paul. Paul 
practically shunned by the community, spent the majority of his days isolated. As such, he began to fantasize about all the terrible things that he would love to do to the women who now shunned him. The fantasies grew darker and darker, and it was only a matter of time before he finally acted on these fantasies. During his late teenage years, Paul was still able to attract girls, and had many short-term relationships. The women that he would woo would quickly find that their Prince Charming was anything but. His sexual needs, which first appeared to be healthy and ordinary, became increasingly sordid, with him beating and humiliating the women during sex. Paul finished high school with decent grades, and as a result, goes to the University of Toronto. During his time at university, Paul would tell his friend and fellow student about his, quote, virgin farm fantasy, which involved him stockpiling women who he would then have sex with whenever he wanted. Unsurprisingly, his friend had begun to distance himself from Paul. Paul graduated university with a Bachelor of Arts degree and found his way into the Chartered Accountants Programme. After graduating, he quickly accepts a job as a junior accountant at Price Waterhouse in Toronto. During this time, Paul has several relationships with multiple women, and he was so controlling that even when they found out about his other relationships, they all stayed with him. But before long, every relationship petered out, and it's now that Paul commits a string of serious sexual attacks that would earn him the name the Scarborough Rapist. The attacks Bernardo would commit in Scarborough were like nothing the district had ever seen before, or indeed since. The whole of Scarborough, and the country as a whole, was blanketed in terror, and the residents lived in fear of attacks. The terror would begin in the spring of 1987, when two young women were assaulted very close to each other. Both victims were attacked from behind in their own properties. They were both told that if they made a sound, they would be killed. Both victims actually had family members in the same house, but were so terrified that they never once called out. Between May and December 1987, there were six more attacks. By this time, officers believed that it was the same perpetrator committing the rapes. When the officers were off shift, many would cruise the area hoping to catch the attacker, but they were unsuccessful. Former detective John Monroe would later say, quote, The sexual assaults were the most brutal that I'd ever seen in my career at that time and I served for 31 years on the Toronto Police Service. Between April and May 1988, there were three more violent attacks. The violence of these assaults were escalating, and he did unspeakable things to his victims. October to December 1988, there were four more attacks. The violence had continued to worsen, and on some of the assaults, Bernardo would gather sticks and stones and insert them into the female that he had just raped. Between June 1989 to May 1990, there were five more attacks. He had now begun to take some of the victim's belongings as trophies. He was also getting bolder, which only caused greater brutality. Some victims reported that he would rape and assault them then leave. After they waited over an hour and finally gathered enough courage to move, Paul would suddenly re-emerge and attack them all over again. Investigating officers knew it was only a matter of time before the attacker graduated to murder. FBI profilers were called in to help with the investigation, and they told the officers that the way that the crimes are escalating, it's clear that he would turn to murder. During the height of the Scarborough rapes, 23-year-old Paul Bernardo would meet 17-year-old Carla Homolka. It was a chance meeting that would have catastrophic consequences. 
Carla was sipping coffee in the lounge of a Scarborough hotel when Bernardo approached her and struck up conversation. As soon as Carla's eyes focused on the suave young Paul, she was hooked. For the last few years, Carla had had a fantasy that she would meet a tall, successful older man. From the outside looking in, Paul Bernardo was her fantasy figure. Hell, he was even better than she could have hoped for. He was handsome, ambitious, owned his own car, and was in a profession where he could easily work his way up. It's safe to say she was completely smitten with him, which quickly became an obsession. Carla took to calling Paul her prince. Carla had come from a very good background, and her family were conservative and traditional. That said, Carla very quickly accepted and embraced Paul's deviancies. Early in their relationship, she would write him long love letters that contained things such as, quote, do what you want to me, and I'll do anything and everything. Something about Paul's deviant sexual needs resonated in her, and his needs and wants quickly became hers also. In 1990, well into Carla and Paul's relationship, police got a break in their search for the Scarborough rapist, who was still committing attacks, just less frequently. During Paul's previous attacks, he was careful to make sure his victims did not get a good look at him, but in May, he let his guard down and was brazen enough to attack a victim from the front. The woman got a good look at her attacker and was able to help police create a composite drawing. After the composite was distributed to all police agencies and media outlets, police received a tip-off. Someone had contacted them and said the image bore a striking resemblance to a 25-year-old local accountant named Paul Bernardo. Former detective John Munro would later recall when he first interviewed Bernardo at the station, saying, quote, I'll never forget this as long as I live. He came into our office late in the afternoon. He was neat, clean. He wore a shirt and tie. His hair was cut. He was very calm, cool and collected. He looked like the all-Canadian boy and I talked to him about different things, about any problems he'd had with women. He said he'd never had any. Did he have a girlfriend now? And he said, I do. My girlfriend's Carla Homolka. Of course, in November of 1990, the name Carla Homolka didn't mean anything to us. Forensic psychologist Dr. Catherine Ramsland, when talking about Bernardo and the act he portrayed during the first police interview, said, quote, Because he has this sweet boy look, this cherub look to him, and charm and gregariousness, he was able, as any good psychopath can, to cover and charm people and make them believe that he's innocent. Paul Bernardo was one of over 700 persons of interest that the Scarborough Rape Task Force were looking into. Out of the 700, they had tested just over 100. John Monroe recalls when he asked Bernardo about his DNA, saying, quote, I asked Bernardo to provide samples of his hair and saliva and blood. He gave them up right away. By doing this, this is my opinion, he was trying to deflect any suspicion on himself by being so cooperative. The DNA samples that were taken from Paul Bernardo would eventually prove that he was indeed the Scarborough rapist. However, the results would not come quickly enough. At the time that his DNA was taken, DNA testing was in his infancy in terms of being a forensic investigative tool. Police had Bernardo's DNA sample, samples that would have sent him to prison for a considerable amount of time, and therefore saving the lives of his later victims. However, the sample sat on a shelf for over two and a half years. Toward the end of 1990, unaware that he was being investigated for the Scarborough rapes, the Homolka family had taken in Paul and accepted him. They were thrilled that Carla had met such a promising young man and were ecstatic when Carla accepted Paul's proposal of marriage. Carla's teenage sister Tammy 
was particularly keen on Paul and thought of him as a big brother. She was so excited to be a bridesmaid at their wedding. Although Bernardo was accepted and doted on by Carla and her family, he was still not satisfied. Not only was he still raping young women, but he also had a target in mind who was much closer to home. Paul had confessed to Carla that he had a thing for virgins and that the thought of taking a girl's virginity is the sweetest pleasure he could receive. Paul admitted that he was frustrated and angry that Carla was not a virgin and that she had had a few sexual partners. He told her that because she could not gift him her virginity, the next best thing would be to take that of her 17-year-old sister Tammy. Unbelievably, Carla agreed. In December, six months before their planned wedding, Carla told Paul that she was gifting her young sister's virginity to him as a Christmas present. She expressed caution, telling Paul that she worried that Tammy would tell her parents what had happened, so Carla came up with a plan. Around this time, Carla was working in a veterinarian clinic, and so she stole a bottle of triazolam, which is an anaesthetic from there, that she planned to use to knock out her sister. Carla explained to Paul that if Tammy was unconscious, then she too would be able to participate in the assault. On the 29th of December, the pair would put their plan into action, despite the fact that Carla's parents were still in the house. In the early hours, everyone had gone to bed, except for Paul, Carla and Tammy. They got Tammy drunk and then drugged her with the stolen anaesthetic. When she was unconscious, both Carla and Paul took turns raping the teenager in every way imaginable. They even filmed the assault from start to finish. It was a prolonged attack and only stopped when something went wrong. During the sexual assault, unbeknownst to the pair, Tammy had turned blue. At some point, she had vomited and it blocked her airway, essentially suffocating her. They panicked and tried to clean up any evidence of wrongdoing. They redressed Tammy, did the laundry, and then moved her to the basement. They then telephoned emergency services and reported that Tammy had stopped breathing. The EMTs arrived quickly and whisked Tammy to the nearest St. Catherine's Hospital. A few hours later, she was confirmed dead. Despite there being a large chemical burn on Tammy's face, which was caused from having a drug-laced towel put over it, medical officials ruled the death as an accident. They believed Paul and Carla when they said Tammy had simply drunk too much. Tammy's untimely and unplanned death would sadly not signal an end to their deviant sexual practices. In fact, it would actually signify the start of their murderous spree. Whilst the Homolka family were all grieving the devastating loss of Tammy, her killers continued preparations for their wedding. Both Paul and Carla feigned remorse, with the pair openly weeping about her death, but that didn't last. Once the funeral was over, where the disgusting pieces of shit who murdered her actually had the nerve to place a photo of themselves in her coffin, a photo where they are both smiling and waving to the camera. When that was over, they completely gave up all pretenses. Shortly after the funeral, Carla began to pressure her grieving parents to go ahead with the wedding, which they were paying for. Carla wrote many scathing letters to her friend, where she expressed her anger that her parents still weren't over Tammy's death. Carla wanted all the attention back on her, with the wedding going ahead as planned, Carla and Paul moved into their own home in St. Catharines, in a small community that was considered an extremely safe place to live. The pair were busy planning their extravagant and lavish fairy tale wedding, but that did not stop Paul planning another assault. His rape and the subsequent murder of Tammy had not abated his twisted urge for virginal sex. He had begun to talk to Carla about how having a sex slave around the house would be good. He wanted a slave that he could use and abuse whenever he wanted. 
Unfortunately, on June 15th, Paul would find his slave. On June 15th, 15-year-old Leslie Mahaffey had gone out for the evening with friends. A boy at her school had tragically died, so Leslie and friends went out to mourn and reminisce about their friend. Leslie lived in Burlington, in a very nice middle-class neighbourhood, with her mother and stepfather. Leslie was a straight-A student and was very reliable and sensible, but she did have one downfall. She sometimes forgot her key or came home past her curfew. If either of those two things happened, she would have to knock on the door and wake her parents up, as they would lock the door at her curfew time. Her parents did this as tough love and hoped it would teach her to be responsible and to come home on time. For the most part, she did exactly that. On the tragic night of Friday, June 15th, Leslie had forgotten her keys, and upon arriving home, she found the door locked. For reasons unknown, Leslie had decided against waking her parents. How she ended up with Paul Bernardo is not known, but we do know that Bernardo had spotted and spoken to Leslie, and was able to get her in his vehicle. He then took her back to his home in Burlington by force. When Paul arrived home with the terrified teenager, Carla was asleep. He woke her up saying, quote, Here's this woman I found. When Carla went into the living room, she became enraged and screamed at Paul. Not because he had abducted a young woman, but rather because Paul had allowed her to drink from one of their expensive glasses. Over the next 36 hours, Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka systematically raped and tortured the young girl, all the while filming it for their later pleasure. During the assaults, Paul would demand Leslie repeat specific degrading phrases. Forensic psychologist Professor Louis Schlesinger would later comment on why Paul did this, saying, quote, Bernardo engaged in scripting of his victims. He told his victims what to say, tell me how great I am, tell me I'm the king, and so on. He is sexually aroused by degrading and humiliating his victim in a very extreme way. Bernardo was unable to achieve a full erection unless he was brutalising his sexual partner. He had to humiliate and degrade the women he had sex with, and this scripting helped him achieve an erection. His narcissism and inflated ego also meant that he would make his victims constantly tell him how much better he was than their boyfriends. After using Leslie Mahaffey as much as they could, Paul Bernardo would take her young life. He strangled her to death and left her body down in the basement. Unbelievably, Paul and Carla entertained Carla's parents at their home on the day they murdered Leslie Mahaffey, leaving her body laying in the basement. Carla would go in and out of that basement throughout the day, bringing up the drinks and food that were stored down there. It's that level of callousness that would amaze and disgust officers, jurors and the entire world's population when they were finally caught. The following day, Paul set up a large plastic tent in the basement. He plugged in a power saw and decapitated and dismembered Leslie Mahaffey. With that done, he encased each piece of her body in cement. He would later drive to a lake where he tossed the concrete slabs over a bridge and into the water. Debbie Smith Mahaffey reported her daughter Leslie missing the day after she failed to return home. She had originally assumed that she had stayed at a friend's house, which she sometimes did, although she was usually telephoned home and let them know. Debbie and Leslie's stepfather called and visited every friend of their daughters that they could think of. When they found that none of them were with Leslie, they then telephoned police. Investigators quickly mobilised and held a search of the surrounding areas. After searching for several days, and finding nothing of the girl, they called the search off. Leslie's disappearance completely baffled detectives, 
and they did not know where to look. Fourteen days after Leslie was reported missing, a canoeist on Lake Gibson would have the unfortunate honour of helping detectives by finding the missing schoolgirl. The concrete used to encase the limbs had not hardened properly, and when tossed into the water, some of it had come apart, and the limb had come free. Later that day, investigators dredged the lake and found all eight concrete blocks. On that very same day, on the day Leslie was found, the day her family were given the heartbreaking news of the discovery, Carla and Paul were getting married. To everyone present at the wedding, they were treated to a truly magical event. Carla arrived to the church in a horse and carriage, just like the princess she always dreamed of being. Every guest reveled in the couple's happiness and enjoyed watching the lovebirds pose and smile for the camera. But behind the smiles, the couple were holding the dark secret of Leslie Mahaffey and were unaware that her remains had been found. When they read the paper the next morning about the gruesome discovery, it did not dampen their shared sexual deviancy, it heightened it. They had got away with murdering Tammy, so they believed that they would get away with this one too. Despite the public horror and the high-profile police investigation, the husband and wife were busy preparing for their next victim. Only this time, they would both go on the hunt together. Kristen French was a remarkable 15-year-old. Beautiful, popular, with a tremendous sense of humour, she was the apple of her parents' loving eye. She was also a very safe girl, always warning her friends about approaching strangers. After the disappearance and murder of Leslie Mahaffey, Kristen always made sure her friends walked to and from school in groups. On the 16th of April, 1992, Kristen was walking home from the Holy Cross Secondary School in the afternoon in broad daylight. She walked home alone as it was so early and bright. It was highly unlikely anything bad would ever happen to her. Unfortunately, something bad was waiting for her. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka sitting in their car. Kristen was standing outside the Grace Lutheran Church when she spotted Carla standing outside her car, who she thought was an attractive young woman, alone, holding aloft a large map, looking lost and frustrated. Kristen, concerned that this young woman was lost and vulnerable, did not think twice about helping. She approached Carla and offered her assistance. When both women were looking down at the map, Paul approached from behind, grabbed Kristen, and forced her into the car at knife point. They had brazenly just abducted a schoolgirl in public and in broad daylight. They sped from the scene and took her back to their Burlington home. From the moment Kristen was inside the home, she was brutally raped and tortured. At some point early into her ordeal, Kristen saw an opportunity to escape. Paul was going out to get the three of them some food, and Kristen said she wanted something from the farthest outlet in St. Catherine's, knowing that she would have at least half an hour before he returned. When Paul left to get the food, Kristen pleaded and begged Carla to let her go. She believed Carla, as a woman, would be able to feel compassion for her. Sadly, Carla was not the compassionate type, Paul took over an hour to return home, during which Kristen constantly begged to be let go. Carla would not budge and threatened the girl that she would tell Paul if she didn't stop asking. When Paul returned home, they fed their captive before continuing with the sexual assault, all of which they filmed. Louis Schlesinger would later say, quote, the fact that they videotaped the sadistic conduct is actually quite common. That's what sexual sadists do, and they do it because they want to manufacture their own pornography, where he's really the star actor. After 72 hours of degradation and sadistic torture, 
Paul Bernardo strangled Kristen to death. Paul and Carla then bathed and scrubbed the body clean and cut off all of her hair, hoping it would delay her identification. They then dumped her corpse in a ditch along a side road in North Burlington. Kristen French's nude body was found on April 30th, 1992. There were to be no more confirmed murders after that of Kristen French. All was not well for the once happily married couple, with the relationship breaking down shortly after they murdered Kristen. Paul had begun to completely live in his delusional world, and had started to get abusive with Carla. One day, Paul attacked Carla and beat her up pretty bad, striking her several times in the face with a heavy flashlight. Her parents convinced her to contact police and report her husband for domestic violence. In a piece of good fortune, when Carla finally contacted the police, the DNA samples from the Scarborough Rape Task Force were finally analysed and they came back as a direct match to Bernardo. Officers interrogated Carla and presented her with their findings. Without much pressure, Carla admitted that Paul had confessed to her that he was the Scarborough rapist. Paul Bernardo was arrested that day. When investigating officers spoke to Bernardo after his arrest, he was no longer the quiet, confident individual that they had met before. Instead, he just told them that he wouldn't tell them anything and then remained mostly silent. However, Carla was talking she confessed to investigators that Paul had murdered her sister Tammy, Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French and she admitted involvement with all three. However, she claimed that she was a battered wife and an unwilling accomplice. There was little evidence against Bernardo to convict him for the murders. Prosecutors felt that they needed a witness so they offered Carla a deal. Testify against your husband and you will receive a reduced sentence of 12 years. She accepted the deal and all the paperwork was submitted and a date was set for trial. But before the trial, a discovery was made that would show that the self-proclaimed battered wife was far more implicated in the murders than first thought. This new light would horrify a whole nation. Hidden in the ceiling of the bathroom in their St. Catherine's home, investigators found a collection of shocking home video cassettes. The many tapes had handwritten title stickers on them in Carla's handwriting. Written on the tapes were titles such as, quote, Kristen, Leslie, Paul and Me, which were surrounded by hearts and flowers. On these tapes, Detectives discovered that Carla was no unwilling accomplice. She could be seen actively participating in the rape and torture of three young girls right beside her husband. In the videos, Carla is smiling and clearly enjoying the experience. Detectives had been played by Carla and it was now too late to back out of the deal that they had offered. Tim Danson the attorney for the victim's families, was required to view the horrendous home movies. He would later say, quote, It was a pretty awful thing to be part of, in the sense to see that level of pain and anguish and despair at unspeakable levels. It is not something that any human being should ever endure, and I'm talking about Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. It's that... It's that disturbing. One thing that was clear when you look at those tapes is that the level of evilness and the level of psychopathy with both these people is so extreme. Like, there is no ounce of being human. These people were animals. The tape collection also included the footage of Paul and Carla raping the unconscious and dying Tammy Hamolka. As well as this, there were sex tapes recorded shortly after her sister's death, where Carla is mimicking Tammy. Within three weeks of her death, 
Carla was on the screen, dressed in her sister's clothing, enticing Paul with no remorse at all. At trial, everyone present would have to watch excerpts of all the videos recovered. Everyone could see that Carla was as guilty and complicit as Paul. However, the deal stuck and Carla would only be sentenced to 12 years behind bars. Paul Bernardo received a life sentence without parole. As of this moment, Carla Hamolka is free and walking the streets under an assumed name. Worse still, she is the mother of three children and is not monitored by police in any capacity. After the husband and wife were sentenced, the media and public alike speculated about the crimes. What had made them do it and who was the driving force in the partnership? Paula Todd, an author who wrote the book Finding Carla, where she tracked down the killer after she was released, spoke about the killings years later, saying, quote, Nature versus nurture is a puzzling question in the case of Paul Bernardo and Carla Hamolka. Carla Hamolka apparently had a really nice suburban childhood. Oldest of three children, pretty, popular, had a little bit of dark teenage years, but nothing unusual, and then becomes, if not the driving force behind sexual torture and murder, is certainly a partner in crime to despicable crimes, planned crimes. Paul Bernardo, on the other hand, had been described as probably mentally unwell from his early childhood. Now, of course, psychopathy can develop from a bad childhood, and we know that Bernardo was not treated well, that he was told at a very susceptible period that he was illegitimate. Louis Schlesinger would also comment, saying, quote, He used Hamolka for his own needs, and Hamolka fed off Bernardo to satisfy her own needs. There was a symbiotic relationship. How these things develop is probably a combination of internal and environmental factors, but in my judgment, and the judgment of most people who have studied this in a serious way, that there's a significant neurobiological component to this, whether it's hormonal, genetic, electrical, chemical, exacerbated by head injury and plus psychosocial factors, a lot of things have to go wrong which makes these crimes extraordinary. So, if Paul Bernardo had never met Carla Hamolka, would either of them have become murderers? Many professionals have speculated that Carla would not have become a murderer without Paul's influence. However, if she had met another killer, it's highly likely that she would have done the same thing. Bernardo was not necessarily a master manipulator, he was just someone who enabled Carla to express her darkest desires. That said, the huge majority of everyone who has studied this case believe that Bernardo would have been a killer, whether he met Hamolka or not. Before Carla, he was raping and attacking women and the attacks were growing steadily in ferocity. It was only a matter of time before he started to murder the women he was assaulting. The fact that he met a woman who allowed him to bring victims home only made the process easier. If he had met a woman who was horrified when asked to be his accomplice in rape and murder, he would have just moved on to the next one. This is the point in the video where I'll give my own personal thoughts and feelings about the case. I will do my absolute best to be as unbiased as possible, which will be difficult. I say this because I find myself far angrier at Carla, which I will explain shortly. In Paul Bernardo, we see a man who had a troubled upbringing, with an unloving mother and a pervert of a father. His path was set from a very early age, and was always likely to commit disgusting acts. As we know, he committed scores of rapes and attacks on women before meeting Carla. But in Carla, we find a woman who came from a very loving background, 
he was given everything that she could ever need. Love, comfort, stability, affection, guidance, pretty much everything needed to help you develop into a decent, well-adjusted human being. However, as soon as she met a man with any dominance, she immediately discarded every value that her family had taught her. She sacrificed her own sister, let her partner rape and abuse her own sibling. Not only that, but she raped her own sister. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that Carla was ever inappropriate with Tammy before meeting Paul. The reason I find myself more angry at Carla is because she had every chance to stop these attacks. She could have reported Paul the second he admitted to the Scarborough rapes, or when he approached the subject of raping Tammy. She also had the opportunity to let Kristen French go when Paul was out, but she never did. If anyone out there still believes that Carla suffered from battered wife syndrome, then you really are mistaken. If the subject wasn't so serious, it would almost be comical that Carla run to police when Paul attacked her. She was devastated and hurt that he would dare attack her, despite the fact he had murdered people, including her own sister. Carla Hamolka was just as disgusting and evil as her husband, but in a different way. Carla was an enabler of the worst kind. She was so focused on herself and her own needs that she allowed her husband and fully participated in the brutal murder of three innocent young women. There is a reason that her deal with the prosecutors was named the deal with the devil. Paul Bernardo was a sadistic psychopath who could only achieve sexual gratification by abusing and degrading young women. Yes, Carla stirs slightly stronger emotions in me, but don't be mistaken, I detest Bernardo just as much. It's just that Bernardo is easier to understand and analyse, as we have ample research on how psychopaths, narcissists and sadists' minds work. Carla is just harder to identify. Lastly, I have to mention the 12 years Carla served. That has to be one of the most disgustingly light sentences in criminal history. There is absolutely no way that she should be walking free today, let alone being a mother. She took three children from their mothers, and she should have been imprisoned for the rest of her worthless life. I'm glad to read that she is constantly being kicked out of the community when her real identity is exposed. Although, I do feel terrible for her children, who are completely innocent. But, if Carla was good at anything, it was ruining the lives of innocent children. Thank you so much for joining me on another video. This is a story that has always intrigued me, and I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know down in the comments how you feel about this story and its outcome. If you feel inclined to support this channel, AWIA now has a Patreon, the link of which is in the description. If you could spare any money to help keep this channel running, it would be highly appreciated. However, this channel will always produce free content for you, and that will never change. Until next time, long days and pleasant nights.